good afternoon today we'll talk about salivary glands the part 2 session so we'll be dealing with sal uh, superficial parotidectomy briefly then uh, a few of the complications like Frey syndrome and parotid fistula and also I'll put in a few words about Jogren syndrome so superficial parotidectomy I have told earlier that uh, the for the diagnosis of our tumors like Parthen tumor and Tumorphic adenoma today it is a preferred procedure. So here the incision is a lazy S shaped type of incision. Once you place the incision, you will raise the flaps and then you will see the gland. The gland will be mobilized and while you mobilize the gland you will identify the sternocleidomastoid muscle, the great auricular nerve and the posterior digastric. Then you will identify the facial nerve trunk and trace it into the parotid gland. Then you will begin the dissection of the gland from the facial nerve taking care not to injure the facial nerve. And the superficial lobe of the parotid gland is removed. Then hemostasis is ensured and the wound is closed. So that is the procedure in simple words. So this is the lacy S shaped incision slightly in front of the ear then beneath the ear lobe and going upwards and then possibly coming along the line of the mandible in the second picture you can see the flap being raised and this shows the facial nerve trunk dividing into upper superior and inferior or upper and lower uh, trunks which further divides into the temporal and zygomatic and uh, the inferior one divides into buccal, marginal mandibular and cervical branch. The five terminal branches of the facial nerve. The green tubular structure you see anteriorly to the par parotid gland is the parotid duct. So this is how it would look like a tumor involving the superficial lobe of the parotid gland. And once you place the incision, raise the flaps, this is how the tumor would look like. Now remember at this point, you are not able to make out the facial nerve. You need to trace the main trunk and then start dissection of the gland. So, saying that, the few complications. Obviously, the injury to the facial nerve is one of the dreaded complications of uh, parotid surgery. Bleeding and infection are the uh, common complications which are usually there associated with any surgery. Then flap necrosis due to the odd shape of the incision. Salivary fistula can happen. Frey syndrome. Sire seal is like collection of the saliva in the parotid bed. Then you can have occasionally numbness over face and ear. So the topic proper is about Frey syndrome and the parotid fistula. So Frey syndrome. It's also known as gustatory sweating or auriculotemporal syndrome and the etiology for it is usually uh, it is seen usually following parotid surgery or surgery of the temporomandular joint or accidental injury to the parotid region or the temporomandular joint region now before going into what is auriculotemporal syndrome or Frey syndrome i'll just mention about a few of the innovations in this area so you must understand that the parotid gland has got sensory, sympathetic and parasympathetic supply. Now here I would like to uh, give you the importance of the auriculotemporal nerve. Now auriculotemporal nerve just contains some of the fibers coming from the aortic ganglion. It's basically a, a, a branch from the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve which contains the postganglionic fibers coming via the aortic ganglion. And these fibers have sensory, sympathetic and parasympathetic. Now, the parasympathetic fibers are the ones that actually are secretomotor to the parotid gland and they are uh, supplied to the parotid gland and they originate from the glossopharyngeal nerve or the ninth cranial nerve via the tympanic nerve, reaches the tympanic plexus and from there the fibers go through the lesser petrosal nerve, reach the aortic ganglion. From there the post fibers or post ganglionic parasympathetic fibers travel along the auriculotemporal nerve. Now, the auriculotemporal nerve already contains the sensory 
branches as auricula and the temporal branch which supply uh, certain areas of the skin which I will be telling you. Now, in addition to that there is also another ganglion which contains the, which supplies the sympathetic fibers and that is not shown in this picture. So you have the superior cervical ganglion from which you have the sympathetic fibers which travel via the aortic ganglion but it does not uh, synapse in the aortic ganglion, just travels through it, across it and then travels along the auricular temporal nerve. So the auricular temporal nerve carries parasympathetic fibers from the aortic ganglion to the parotid gland and also uh, carries along the sympathetic fibers which arise from the superior cervical ganglion. The auricular branch supplies sensory supply, supplies the uh, external acoustic meatus, surface of the tympanic membrane and the skin of the external ear auricle above the external acoustic meatus. Temporal branch supplies the hairy skin of the temple. So what is Frey syndrome? Frey syndrome occurs due to an injury to the auricular temporal nerve. The postganglionic parasympathetic fibers from the aortic ganglion unite with the sympathetic fibers from the superior cervical ganglion. There is inappropriate regeneration of damaged parasympathetic fibers to the overlying skin. So you can see in this picture, the A shows the normal. So you have the nerve, you have the sensory supply which goes to the skin as well as to the parotid gland. You have the sympathetic fibers which travel to the skin that is sweat glands and the parotid gland. You have the parasympathetic fibers which travel only to the parotid gland. Now once you did the parotid surgery or there is trauma to that bed, the gland is no longer there and this nerve if injured, that is the parasympathetic post fibers if injured, may regenerate inappropriately to supply the skin and the sweat glands. So that is what is shown in picture B. You can see the inappropriate connection or regeneration of the parasympathetic fibers with the sympathetic fibers which supply the skin and sweat glands. So what is the clinical feature? Patient gives a history of surgery or injury to the parotid region maybe a few months before. Patient complains of flushing, sweating, redness or erythema, pain and increased sensation of hyperesthesia in the skin over the face supplied by the auricular temporal nerve during mastication or chewing. So when the person is chewing the food, at that point he has redness, flushing and sweating in the skin area supplied by the auricular temporal nerve. So it will be over the uh, area in front of the ear involving the ear and little above the ear involving the temporal region. So that is the complaint and that is a very distressful symptom because every time the person eats food, this symptoms may appear. So how do you diagnose this condition? So there is something known as a minor, minor starch iodine test. So the affected skin is painted with iodine and dried. And then dry starch is applied over the area. Starch turns blue on exposure to iodine in the presence of sweat. So when the skin starts sweating during the chewing process or during mastication, then the color change develops a blue color. So this is how the person looks. On doing the iodine test, you can see the discoloration in that same area where the portion which is having the regeneration is affected. The treatment is reassurance. It may recover spontaneously without any treatment over 5 to 6 months. But in case of moderate to severe symptoms, application of antiperspirants like aluminum chloride and anticholinergic ointments like Scopolamine 3 person have been tried. Alternatively, you can also try injection botulinum toxin. It has been found to be effective in reducing the symptoms. Now, surgically, a procedure known as tympanic neurectomy. Now, in the picture I had shown you earlier that the glossopharyngeal nerve, which through which the parasympathetic fibers come, travel via the tympanic nerve in the middle ear and then goes to the tympanic plexus and like that reaches the via the lesser petrosal nerve to the aortic ganglion. So if you cut off the tympanic branch over there, in, that is known as tympanic neurectomy, it is known to uh, treat the symptoms and to prevent the further symptoms because of this uh, inappropriate regeneration of parasympathetic fibers. Similarly, during the original surgery, lifting of the skin flap and placing a tissue barrier like dermal or fat graft 
that is between the parotid band and the skin is known to prevent the inappropriate regeneration. Similarly, instead of fat graft, you can use temporal fascia or sternum asteroid muscle also can be done. Now, this has to be done at the time of surgery. Alternatively, if possible, a resurgery can be done to do the same. Now, a few words about parotid fistula. Now, parotid fistula may arise from the parotid gland or the parotid duct or the ductules. It may open inside the mouth as an internal fistula or may open outside onto the skin as an external fistula. The incidence is around 0.2 to 3%. So, what are the common causes? So, it may occur as a complication of superficial parotidectomy if the duct gets injured. It can occur after drainage of a parotid abscess or after rupture of an abscess, of a parotid abscess. It can occur after biopsy of the parotid region, parotid, uh, uh, parotid gland, following trauma of parotid gland, recurrence of malignant tumor. So, these are the causes for parotid fistula. So it's got, it's of two types. You have the duct fistula and the gland fistula. A duct fistula usually forms after superficial parotidectomy. It has profuse discharge and often persists. Uh, the treatment, the duct should be ligated anteriorly to allow the normal drainage from the deep lobe. Now why in superficial parotid, you must remember that the deep lobe of the parotid gland still remains. And the secretions will come from the deep lobe. So here the duct has to be ligated anteriorly. Now, in a gland fistula, it forms on the raw surface after superficial parotectomy. There is only minimal discharge and usually subsides in a month with anticholinergic drugs or after tympanic neurectomy. So, tympanic neurectomy has the benefit of cutting off the parasympathetic secretomotor fibers to the region. So, clinical features. So, it presents as a discharging fistula in the parotid region of the face. And the discharge is usually more during eating or mastication. There is usually tenderness and induration. Sometimes it can present with Christmas. Now the investigation here is silography classically, but today a CT or MR fistulogram can also be done. The discharge will show high amylase levels. So initially medical treatment can be attempted. Anticholinergic drugs like hyacinth bromide is found to reduce uh, the symptoms. Uh, the discharge. Similarly, tympanic neurectomy can be done to cut off the secretor motor supply or innovation to the region. Then surgery, other than tympanic, you can do exploration of the fistula and you can excise the fistula just like we do for any other fistulas or you can ligate the fistula or even repair or reinsert the duct into the mucosa. In, uh, in spite of all of this, if still the symptoms of the fistula recurs or persistence or persists, then total conservative parotidectomy can be done in failed cases. So this shows the green color is the duct. If you are attempting to repair the duct, then a stent can be placed and the two ends proximal and distal ends of the duct. And then you can attempt to suture the duct to repair it. Now we'll talk about Jogren syndrome. Jogren syndrome is an autoimmune disease causing progressive destruction of salivary as well as a lacrimal glands, which leads to keratoconjunctivitis sicca and serostomy. That means dry eyes and dry mouth. So there are two types. You have the primary Jogren syndrome and the secondary Jogren syndrome. Primary presence with dry mouth and dry eyes with no known association with connective tissue disorders. Secondary Jogren syndrome presents with dry mouth and dry eyes with association with connective tissue disorders like primary biliary cirrhosis, systemic lupus erythematosus and rheumatoid arthritis. Clinically, it affects the middle-aged females, usually presents with dry eyes and dry mouth. The parotid glands are enlarged, the lacrimal glands are enlarged. Sometimes oral candidiasis can also be seen, which happens secondary to the dry mouth. The common investigations are anti-nuclear antibody 
assay or ANA profile study or ANA study to assess for autonuclear autoantibodies which are positive in uh, Jogren syndrome. Then a rheumatoid factor assay can be done. A silography will assess the amount of uh, saliva flow. The salivary flow test can be done. For the eyes, a slit lamp test and Schirmer's test to assess the amount of tears. FNAC of the parotid gland and FNAC of the lacrimal gland will help in establishing a histological diagnosis. Technician scan is also known to help in diagnosing Jogren syndrome, but is not routinely done. The treatment, conservative management is the line, is a treatment, is a line of treatment. For the dry eyes, artificial tears can be given. And for the uh, dry mouth, artificial saliva is also available. And to encourage the person, bring lots of water and frequent drinking of water. And once identified, find out the cause, whether there is any association with other connective tissue disorders and treat the cause. So this is briefly about Jogren syndrome. It is a vast topic, but just for the purpose of knowing what is Jogren syndrome, I have said a few words about it. So, Thank you.